Good morning, everyone. We'd like to get started now, and we will hand it over to Health Director Gibby Harris. Gibby. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, I have with me uh, Dr. Meg Sullivan. She's our Public Health Med Med Medical Director, excuse me. Um, Dr. David Priest, he's a Senior VP for Novant Health. And um, I'm not sure he's on yet, but joining us will be <clears throat> Excuse me, Dr. Gary Little is the Chief Medical Officer for Atrium Health. Um, I have a few opening remarks and then we'll be opening it up for questions from the group. Um, just as an update, our metrics continue to trend in the right direction here in Mecklenburg County. Our positivity rate is hanging around 5.6%. Our case count continues to drop as well as our hospitalizations. We're seeing improvements there as well. I'm pleased to announce that our outbreaks in our, our long-term care facilities and other um, congregate living sites is down to 39. That's almost half of what it was back in the middle of January, so significant improvement there. I do want to um, also remind people about issues that we are facing that we need to pay attention to. Um, one is the increasing number of variants that may be available in our community. We know they're not available, but um, are present in our community. And we know that those variants are present in the United States and the likelihood that we may be seeing some of that activity in our community increases. 
We're also seeing increased activity in our community based on the governor's order and the uh, lessening of some of the restrictions, which is a good thing, um, but we need to be cautious. We need to continue to use common sense on where we go, when we go, how we go in our community so that these numbers can continue to decrease for us. Um, unfortunately, we are still at about the same place we were at our spike in mid-July. So although our numbers have come down significantly, we still have a lot of virus in our community and need to be vigilant in our, our efforts to make sure we're continuing to prevent um, the spread of this virus. So wearing your mask, socially distancing, not engaging in uh, activities that put you at risk of exposure unless they're necessary. So limiting, again, your activity outside your home. But the other thing that we have going for us right now are our vaccines. Um, with the announcement over the weekend of the approval of J&J &J vaccine, the one-shot vaccine is, is great news for us. Now we have three vaccines that we can depend on. We will be receiving additional vaccine in our community this week that we will use over the next week and a half for the priority groups that we have. The health department is receiving 11,000 doses of J&J, &J, as well as an additional 5,850 doses of Pfizer. Those doses were um, requested from the state as a joint effort between Atrium, Novant, and the health department to work on getting those individuals who are priority right now for our vaccine vaccinated as quickly as possible. So that's, those vaccines will be shared with both of our healthcare systems, and we will work on getting those vaccines out as quickly as possible. Um, in addition to that, I think we had a press release that went out just a few minutes ago. Our department, the health department, um, is a, announcing additional appointments being made available March 10th through the 31st. Individuals in groups one through three who are eligible at this point in time are going to be able to go online or through our hotline for those appointments beginning March 4th. So uh, that is good news for us as well. So I'm going to stop there. Um, j and J, I I believe, and we all believe, and you're gonna hear this from the experts in just a minute, um, are, are, is a very safe and effective vaccine as well as the Pfizer and the Moderna, and we're excited about having additional vaccine available in Mecklenburg County. So I'm gonna stop there and um, allow for questions at this point. And it appears that Dr. Little is having some computer issues, so hopefully I'll be able to join us in just a few minutes. Okay, first question today is Claire Donnelly, WFAE. Um, hi, I wondered if you have any updated timeline, um, I guess this is for either Dr. Sullivan or um, Gibby Harris, um, of when you expect the J&J &J vaccines to arrive, when people can start getting vaccinated with that, and how many appointments are you opening up in this next round? I'll let Dr. Sullivan answer those questions. Yeah, so we don't have the exact date that the Johnson & Johnson will arrive. We do believe that it will arrive sometime this week, um, and uh, but we're waiting to receive official shipping notice and time frame from the state uh, about that. Um, and in terms of, as, as Gibby mentioned, we are going to be collaborating with both Novant and Atrium to get those doses out into the community over the next several days. Uh, in terms of opening up additional appointments uh, at our Bojangles Coliseum, again, we'll, we will be opening a limited number, likely somewhere around 400 appointments a day, um, and then continuing to open appointments as vaccines become available. Next question is Brett Jensen, WBT Radio. Thanks for doing this, guys. Um, I'm curious, I, I think this will fall with uh, Dr. Priest. Um, it's expected today that Governor Cooper is going to open up more Group 3 today, earlier than the scheduled March 10th. Um, that's some of the reports coming out of Raleigh. So we know that teachers are having teacher-only vaccine events um, where uh, the rest of the public, 65 and older for Groups 1 and 2, are not made available or not allowed to do it. Um, do you think that there should be events maybe just for restaurant workers or just um, the police officers? where the other groups are excluded as well? Or do you think this is just a unique thing to teachers? 
Yeah, and I, I'm happy to address that. I think from our standpoint, you know, we follow the groups very closely. Uh, we look at the patients and individuals that are in phase that the state is recommending. It all comes down to vaccine allotment and volume, right? So um, the, the reason we have all these issues is we don't quite have all the vaccine we want or need. And so we have to uh, try to prioritize in the best way we can, given the guidance we have from our local public health officials on this call and the state and, and, our, and our federal guidance. So uh, we understand their competing priorities and their frustrations among groups in the community. And the only way that's gonna be totally alleviated is to have more vaccine. The exciting part is we have a third vaccine coming this week. And I think as we get into April allotment on all three of the vaccines is just going to go higher and higher and higher. That will leave some of the bottlenecks that occur because of this. Um, you know, when I was in medical school and uh, the surgeon asked me to cut the sutures in a case, they were either too short or too long. Um, and this is the same case here. It's so hard to get this exactly right. There's not going to be perfection in this kind of rollout simply because of limitations, in the amount of vaccine we have. Um, so, uh, I think all of the people in the groups you mentioned are well deserving of vaccine, need vaccine to protect themselves in our community. Um, and we'll be working in any way we can to collaborate with the county and, and the state to get events for whoever is eligible as we get into those groups. But as of right now, we don't have enough vaccine to accommodate every person, certainly in group three. Next question, Hannah Smoot, Charlotte Observer. Hey there, Dr. Sullivan. Um, could you maybe talk a little bit about how important it's going to be to get this one shot vaccine into the community? And, and then what would you say to people who are maybe, you know, ranking their vaccine preference based on this efficacy rate? Uh, what would you say to those people? Yeah, thank you for that question. And I think I'll just follow up on what Dr. Priest just said, that our goal is to get as many people vaccinated as possible. And uh, again, to follow up on what Gibby said, we are incredibly excited that we now have three very safe and effective vaccines. So at this moment, it is important for us to get as much vaccine in the community as possible. That includes the Pfizer vaccine, that includes the Moderna vaccine, and that includes the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And our advice to everybody at this time continues to be, if you are eligible for a vaccine, please make an appointment for a vaccine and make an appointment for the vaccine that is available. I think, again, as we get further down the road and potentially even more vaccines become available, kind of having conversations about different vaccines. But right now, we know that all that three vaccines are safe and effective, and we want to get them all out as quickly and equitably as possible. Next question is Tony Messia, Charlotte Ledger. Good morning. Thank you for uh, holding this and for taking my question. Just following up on really on Brett's question, uh, this is for uh, for Gibby Harris. Um, as it relates to you know the governor's uh, press conference this afternoon, you know he's expected to accelerate some of these timelines. What have you heard about that from the governor's office? And if he does move up uh, Group Three by a week, starting tomorrow, would Mecklenburg County be able to uh, accelerate its timeline as far as uh, making? vaccine available to frontline essential workers? That's a great question. We have had conversations with the state about this. The, the challenge with the governor making decisions about when to open things up is that he has to look at the whole state. Mm -hmm. So what's happening in Mecklenburg is not necessarily happening in other counties. There are counties who have been able because they've got much smaller numbers than we have and have gotten relatively more vaccine than we have, that they've been able to get through groups faster than we have, and the state doesn't want to hold them back. And that's my understanding as to why they're moving forward with the possibility of opening up the rest of group three. But the guidance that I'm getting from the state as well is that we need to make a decision here in Mecklenburg County about who we're vaccinating based on the vaccine that we've had available and the groups that we're trying to move through so that we're not leaving people um, behind who are eligible for vaccine. So that being said, I will say that we've gotten additional vaccine in, or we're getting it in this week. The intent behind that original vac initial vaccine and the request to the state was to make sure that we had enough vaccine to get our educators, our childcare workers, as well as um, our, our school staff vaccinated as quickly as possible. So all of the planning that has gone into how we're going to move that vaccine out has been focused on those populations. Um, that being said, we are also having lots of conversations with both of our healthcare systems about the process for getting vaccine out to the larger group three. And there's lots of plans in place um, over the next month or so as we get more vaccine to make sure that that's available to those groups as well. 
So as you know, we are opening um, appointments uh, through the health department starting, uh, the appointments are available starting March 10th. We're making them on the 4th, starting to make them on the 4th, but they're, they're available on the 10th because we're booked through the 9th. And I imagine both healthcare systems are in the same spot being booked up and with the events that we've planned, that they've been focused on the, the initial part of group three. So we will move through the rest of group three as fast as we can and do that in as organized a fashion as we can to make sure that that vaccine is available. But um, as Dr. Priest mentioned, we can't make it available if we don't have it. Okay, and then just a quick follow up for Dr. Little and Dr. Priest. If, if the governor comes out today and says group three is open starting tomorrow, will Atrium and Novant start um, booking appointments for that tomorrow? Yeah, um, if whatever group is eligible, um, is eligible to book appointments through our, our scheduling platform, um, when, when they become eligible, um, we're, we're booked out with appointments in our sort of standing sites uh, into June, um, but we have uh, pop-up events uh, between you know, now and the end of the month that we'll be holding and uh, anybody who's eligible from groups one through three will be able to, to schedule into those appointments when they become available. Yeah, and I would say we're in, in agreement with that. And what we're doing is we're moving patients up as vaccine allotment increases. So patients that are currently scheduled in April and May, if we have more vaccine before then, we'll be moving them up and we'll schedule what's in the appropriate group based on the governor's guidance. I think the main point here is that it's a fluid process as we learn more about what vaccine is available. And um, I think all of us are working as hard as we can to get those folks who are eligible into slots so they can get vaccine. Um, our intent is to get the vaccine out as fast as we get it. Um, that's what's gonna benefit our community the most. Next question is Damon E. Lewis. WSOC-TV. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for having this uh, this news conference. A uh, quick question, uh, Gibby. You mentioned uh, that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine will be about 11,000 plus. And can you specifically break down how it's going to be allocated between the healthcare systems and the county and the targeted group that this first round of uh, J&J will be going to? Well, there's a... a <sighs> Again, a fluid situation here. We're, we've worked with both healthcare systems. I think um, I, I'm, I'm not going to give you the numbers because I'll get them wrong. Um, I don't have them in front of me, but there's an allotment going to both healthcare systems, and they have clinics set up that they will use that vaccine um, as, as quickly as possible. I think most of the vaccine, <clears throat> excuse me, at this point is focused on um, that initial part of group three because that's where the state's focus has been up to this point. But again, if we have vaccine that's not being used for that group, we're going to use it for the rest of group three. We're, we're not going to let vaccine go to waste. So um, I think uh, we have, we have uh, different events scheduled um, that do focus on teachers and child care workers. Um, both hospital systems have those efforts uh, scheduled as well. But again, vaccine's not gonna go to waste if we don't have enough of those individuals to use this vaccine, we'll use it for the rest of group three or those who are still eligible in groups one and two and have not gotten vaccine at this point. Next question, Caroline Hicks, WBTV. Hi, thank you. Um, as far as the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, can you talk a little bit about how you are divvying that up between the health department and hospital systems this week? Um, I think I just answered that. I don't have the specific numbers in front of me, but we are making it available to them based on their capacity to get it out, as well as our capacity to get it out. So it's all focused on who has the ability to get the vaccine and out into arms. And we're working as a team to make that available. So um, I, I, again, I don't have the specific numbers in front of me right now. Next question, Chloe Leshner, WCNC. 
Hi there. Sorry if this is a bit repetitive, but moving forward with more people in group three, do you have any concerns, I guess, on the county level of um, people 65 and older getting left behind? I know that we and working with both healthcare systems have continued to prioritize that group. If we have individuals calling for appointments, or on our wait list who are in that age group, um, we're all working to make sure that they have access to the vaccine as quickly as possible. So we're paying attention to groups one and two as we're moving into group three to make sure that those who are eligible are getting vaccine. Next question, Vanessa Rufus, WCNC. Hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, taking my question. I guess this question could be for anyone who wants to answer. Have you gotten any guidance from either the CDC or FDA about, you know, special groups who might not be able to get Johnson & Johnson um, that would be different from the current mRNA vaccines that are on the market or maybe even vice versa? Yeah, I guess um, what the EUA says is, uh, is pretty much anybody can get it over the age of 18, 18 and older. Um, and then obviously anybody who's had an allergic reaction to any of the components can't get it. But other than that, um, you know, it's it's uh, recommended for, you know, patients who have immunocompromised conditions. It's recommended for uh, women who are pregnant or breastfeeding, obviously in consultation with their physician. You know, it's the same guidance from, from that uh, perspective. I think in terms of people who maybe couldn't get the Pfizer or the Moderna or had a reaction to the first dose of either of those two vaccines, this may be um, a, an option for them. And obviously, again, in consultation with their physician prior, but uh, it does open up another option for those people as well. Next question is Caroline Hudson, Charlotte Business Journal. Hi, good morning. Uh, my question is uh, looking farther ahead um, when vaccines do actually become more available and widespread. I um, was wondering if you guys have any thoughts on whether it's important to bring in other groups to vaccinate. I'm thinking about independent groups, more pharmacies, people like that. Um, you know, how will that play into the strategy moving forward? Um, we are actually already working with some of those groups and a lot depends on them going through the process of getting approved by the state. Um, and getting trained to use the state uh, system that, that allows them to record information about the vaccines that they've given. So once they get through that process, um, not a lot of vaccine has been sent directly to them, but we have been able to transfer some doses um, when we have those available so that they're able to provide those within those settings. I think you're gonna see a lot more of that as the vaccine becomes more available. Doctor's offices, pharmacies, grocery store pharmacies, those sorts of places are, are going to be more readily available to individuals as more vaccine becomes available. But it does require them to go through that process of getting approved by the state. <clears throat> Next question is Dominic Lee. Had you a second drop off since the um, people begin their second doses. Can, can you repeat your question again? You it dropped for a second there. Oh, sorry about that. Are you, um is Mecklenburg seeing a drop off after people getting their second doses? Um, a drop off of numbers, people contracting COVID. I want to make sure that we understand your question. Um, is your question you you think you're asking if we're seeing a if the numbers that are going down are related to people being vaccinated? Is that the question you're asking? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, this is David. I can tell you, Novant. I mean, overall, our numbers are much improved. I think it's a good question. It's probably a multifactorial answer. Uh, I think part of the declining numbers was we got past the peaks after our holiday season. 
Um, I think part of the declining numbers is people are masking and, and remaining socially distanced. And I think part of it hopefully is increasing numbers of individuals that have been vaccinated. I think the state of North Carolina now leads in the percentage of people age 65 and older who have gotten a dose of vaccine. Um, so that, that's pretty exciting. So I think it's contributing to some extent. I don't think it's a, the total answer as to why numbers are improving, um, but we'll take it. And hopefully if it's not the total answer as more and more vaccine is, is given, we're just gonna see a continued decline. This is Brett Jensen again with WBT. Uh, for the two doctors, Dr. Little and Dr. Priest, uh, two quick questions that I think are, might be fairly easy to answer. I just want to make sure for my own terms when I'm discussing this later tonight on air that the new Johnson and Johnson vaccine, while it is at like 76% effective rate, but in terms of it's that's in terms of preventing uh, serious uh, side effects from COVID, but it's also but it's got the same rate of preventing hospitalization as the other two. Is that correct? First of all. Yes, it was highly effective in the prevention of severe COVID and hospitalization, um, 82% and higher, depending on, on the location of the trial. So it's incredibly effective. It's, it's uh, percentage in preventing COVID in general is about 72%. The reminder is, as was said earlier, remember, you know, flu shots in a typical year work about 35 to 55% of the time and are still really effective in a community if a lot of people get them. And the same is true here. It's amazing to me that uh, we have three vaccines already for COVID, essentially in less than a year, that are all highly effective. Um, and I, and I, it's kind of a blessing and a curse, right? We're, we're, we're splitting hairs on a few percentage points on how effective a third vaccine is, um, which is great. I'm glad people are paying attention. Um, but a couple of things come into play when you want to ensure that, that vaccines are, are working in a community. One is how effective it is for the individual person, which is what you're referring to. But just as important, if not more important, is how many people get it, right? So we can have very effective vaccines, but if very few people get it, it's not going to put a dent in, our, in the disease burden in a community. Or frankly, there are some mathematical models and flu shots that show you have a vaccine that doesn't work hardly at all 20% of the time, but if everyone got it, we'd all be really protected. So as uh, Dr. Sullivan mentioned earlier, this is a, a, another weapon in our arsenal, you know, fighting this virus, and it's highly effective against the most serious complications, what is what we're really trying to prevent. Dr. Little, follow, and the, the second part is, I know you guys had that mass vaccination event uh, for the second part, you know, the 20,000 thing that you guys just had um, over the weekend. Do you and Dr. Priest know in rough estimates or whereabouts how many doses you guys have given out, at least the first doses? First doses of uh, all, all vaccines at this point? Yes, sir. Um, yeah, we've, I mean, I, I know we've got that information in terms of total first doses. I know that's available, uh, from the state. Um, I think for us in total first doses, uh, it's probably somewhere around, um, 115,000 or so at this point. Yeah, and Novon, our total vaccine number is about 137,000, and our first dose is about 85,000. Yeah, and our total total shots given is uh, just over 200,000 per atrium. Next question, please. Hi, this is Vanessa again with WCNC Charlotte. I suspect this question would be for Gibby. Um, Gibby, I believe I heard you say that you guys have seen um, a pretty notable decrease off of the peak for the number of congregate outbreaks that you've been dealing with. Do you attribute that to anything in particular? Um, are you seeing gains in any particular area, for example, maybe nursing homes versus the county jail or childcare? Um, I guess that's, that's my question. So what, what we know is that many of our long-term care facilities were part of the federal program that allowed the residents as well as the staff of those facilities to get vaccinated through either CVS or Walgreens. And that started late, no, late December, early January. So many of them have had vaccine on board for enough time for there to be some immunity. Um, and 
you know, as we've gotten those folks vaccinated, we've seen those numbers trending down. So um, we've also seen deaths in the community. At one point, over 50% of all of our deaths were from long-term care facilities. That has changed dramatically in the last month. So if you look at those two things, I'd have to think that the vaccine had something to do with it. I think that's a good story because it means that the vaccine's working. Um, and, you know, in addition to that, these, these long-term care facilities have continued to get better in their infection control policies and their, their ability to work with visitors and stuff to make sure that they're doing what they need to do to protect the residents. So um, I do believe, again, though, that the vaccines have had a part to play in that because we know that particular population has been vaccinated more than the rest of the population in Mecklenburg County. And then just a quick follow up. Do you know approximately what percentage now the deaths are from long term care facilities? Um, I don't have the exact number in front of me, but it is very, very small, very small. I'd, I'd say in the 10 percent or less. Thank you. Hi, Caroline Hicks here with WBTV. Um, this is a question for the health department and the hospitals. Do you have rough estimates of how many people are on your waiting lists right now? And how will the Johnson & Johnson vaccine help? Um, how many people roughly will you be able to call this week, for example, um, to get them off that wait list now that you have more vaccine? Sorry. I can start with that. Um, so we have right now approximately 6,000 individuals. It's a, a, a number that's fluid and changes every day. And we really try and make appointments for individuals off our wait list every day, but have more people added. The majority of those individuals, I think I've said this before, do represent that early group three. So our child care and pre-K through 12. Um, and again, we are working hard as we open up more appointments to get people uh, scheduled as quickly as possible. I do want to take the opportunity to say, though, what we have learned is that many individuals who are on our wait list, when we call them to make an appointment, they've actually already been able to get a vaccine or may have an appointment with one of our other systems. And we are really, we're also starting to see an increased number of individuals who are not showing up for appointments. And we are really encouraging individuals that if they have an appointment uh, at a one place to get a vaccine, if they make another appointment, they need to cancel at least one. I think I've heard from both our hospital systems we're seeing this issue as well. Um, and so our goal is, yes, to get as many people vaccinated as possible, but we do want to make sure that people aren't making multiple appointments or um, to, to assist with that process. Hey, this is Katie Peralta Sola from Axio Charlotte. I had a quick follow up to um, the, the comment that you just made about in, an increased number of individuals not showing up for appointments. Um, in that case, what does Mecklenburg County do with the doses that would have gone to those individuals? Yes, I mean, so we've started to adjust our schedule to try and account for that. We also are very thoughtful around how many doses we're drawing up, and we base that not only on anticipated appointments, but also the clinic flow throughout the day. And so if we start seeing that individuals aren't showing up earlier in the day, again, we either um, are working during the day to try and account for that or at the end of the day to not drop as many doses. Next question, please. Any further questions? Do you guys have any indication of how much J and J um, vaccine you will continue to get? Is this kind of a weekly? Have you have you been notified of anything of that, or kind of what are your hopes moving forward? Um, what we have heard from the state is they are receiving a large amount to begin with. Um, they're not sure about the next couple of weeks, whether uh, the assumption is that they won't get as much over the next couple of weeks. So we, we don't know what we could anticipate um, because they don't know what they would, they, I mean, they just don't know what they're going to receive. But um, the assumption is by the end of March, we would should be at more of a steady state and have a good idea of the vaccine that we're going to get moving forward. So again, a very fluid situation, which makes it a little challenging to plan. Um, especially if we're looking at a, additional events that we're having to, to put on. But um, we want to make sure that we're using whatever vaccine is available to Mecklenburg County. So um, all of us are working together to do that as best we can. 
Okay. And then do you guys have any plans? I know right now you're basically asking people to get their first dose and second dose at the same place if they can. Um, I, I was speaking with one teacher who said, you know, she got a first dose through Walgreens and now they're not guaranteeing her a second dose. Would there ever be opportunities for people to kind of like one-off situations to get a second dose through you guys? Or is that not really something you're able to offer at this point? Um, I think all of us are, if there's a special circumstance, um, would be somewhat flexible with this. The challenge is that we receive the number of second doses based on the number of first doses we administer. So to open up to others who got first doses somewhere else, then that means that the individuals who got vaccinated through us might not get their second dose. So we have to be very careful about that. But I think if there's an extraordinary circumstance, there'd be some opportunity to to have that conversation with someone. I'm not sure why Walgreens might not be able to, um, because they, those dollars, right now, most of that vaccine for Walgreens is coming through the federal government. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that they will assure that they get their second doses as well. Yeah, our, our experience is similar. Uh, we've seen people <laughs> come in and ask for second dose because they got it somewhere else, another state or somewhere or occasionally we have people who are hospitalized when they were supposed to get their second dose and they and they miss their appointment somewhere else. It's really complicated to figure out how to do it. We've been able to do it in one-off situations, but our, our team is working on a, a way to, to, to actually carry that out. I think our, our biggest challenge is we don't know how much vaccine to kind of allot for that because we don't know the demand of how many people are, are not getting their second dose from where they got their first dose. So it, it's just really hard to plan for. This is Brett Jensen. I sort of want to follow up on that um, in terms of, you know, trying to figure out where people got doses and stuff. Um, I know it was a major, major issue and uh, it can't be lamented of that so much early on about the, uh, the proficiency of the database. Has the database and entering all this stuff for you guys gotten any easier? Not, not really no i mean yeah. we've, we've done some things uh internally with barcodes scanning um, that we worked with uh, honeywell to implement that's that's really helped um, but it still takes a a team of people to to enter that information on the back end um, i know right now uh, the state is piloting kind of an interface uh which would come from the health systems and, and, and hopefully the health department's EMR to interface that data over to uh, CVMS, but that's still being built and tested. So it, it's it's still not there. So it's still a, a really big burden to, to put that information in. Next question, please. Are there any further questions today? I will thank you everybody for your time. Have a good morning. Thank you.